His love. thought found me bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless God's holy name bless the Lord O my soul and forget not all God's benefits we begin our worship in the name of our God our creator God our redeemer God and our sanctifying God amen The reading for today comes from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith, and the, on the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Here ends the reading. A prayer of Martin Luther. Please join me as we pray. Almighty Father, eternal God, who did allow your Son to suffer the agony of the cross so that you might drive from us the enemy's power, grant that we may so observe his passion and give thanks for it that we may thereby obtain forgiveness of sin and redemption from death eternal. Through the same Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. We continue our march through the Reformation. I want to say thank you again to my Theology of the Reformers class for their participation in our worship service this morning, Laurie Beckman and Jason Exley. And I also want to say thank you to uh, President Anderson for sharing this week with me. And he has the rather unenviable task of uh, cleaning up after me. He's going to be talking about Luther on Wednesday and Friday. and. Um, sewing together any loose ends, with, of which there may be several. We spoke yesterday about Martin Luther's late medieval world. We talked about the decline of the papacy, about humanism, about the printing press, developments in theology. We talked, too, about the sense of religious anxiety that was in many people on the eve of the Reformation. And now we turn to Luther himself. He was born in 1483 in northern Germany. He was the oldest son of Hans and Marguerite Luther. And following the morning of his birth on November 11th, he was baptized at the local church and named for the saint of the day, Martin of Tours. Luther's family was not well-to-do. His father was a miner. He worked in the copper mines. Eventually, Hans Luther would come even to share in ownership of some of the mines, so we get a sense that his father was a fairly industrious person. Luther considered himself always to be of peasant stock, although on his mother's side there's some suggestion of, um, of some educated people. So um, the story, at least in terms of his background, is rather complex. His childhood was rather conventional for that of a late medieval child. His parents were strict, but really nothing out of the ordinary. Um, after preparatory schooling in the cities of Magdeburg and Eisenach, Luther entered the University of Erfurt in 1501. He was a good student. His parents pushed him to go to school. They recognized that he had academic gifts. And in 1505, he received a master's degree. 
Now, there is some suggestion at this time that while Luther is outwardly successful as a student, there's some inner turmoil going on. We're not quite sure just what is happening, but we do know that at the time he received his master's degree, you basically have three choices. You can go on to be study for divinity or law or medicine. Luther at first went on to study for law. This was certainly in accord with his father's wishes as well. He saw that his son was gifted, and he also probably recognized that if his son should do well in law, get a job in one of the courts maybe, that would prosper the Luther name, and also would maybe provide for his parents in his old age. So Martin was in some sense life insurance for Hans as well. Um, however, Luther one day while he's walking home, to the, or back home uh, to the University of Erfurt, he's walking through the woods, and we kind of get a sense that he's on an exposed area, and all of a sudden a dark storm breaks out overhead. Clouds become very dark, lightning, thunder, and in the midst of this storm, he becomes so frightened that he gets down on his knees and he prays to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors. And he says to her, if you will save me from this storm, I will become a monk. Well, the storm passes, Luther lives, and now he's taken a vow, and he enters a monastery, much against his father's wishes. Now, one entered a monastery in that day and age primarily for one reason. There were several things that one could do, but for the most part, if you became a monk, you were very serious about saving your soul. Entering a monastery was sort of a fast track, if you will, a left-hand lane to salvation in the late medieval world. And Luther picked a very strict monastery in which to pursue this path to salvation, the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. In terms of his time in the monastery, he reports that early on, and this would have been years 1505, 1506, 1507, he's 22, 23 years old, Early on, he reports that the devil was fairly quiet. In other words, things were going along tolerably well. However, as he pursues his studies, and as he continues his time in the monastery, he becomes to become more and more disquieted in his soul. Now, you have to remember that the goal in the Augustinian monastery was quite lofty. This is what you had to do. You had to have absolute love of God and perfect humility. Absolute love of God and perfect humility. Luther was serious. He was earnest. He took that ideal very, very seriously. And he found in his monastic experience that he was continually coming up short. He was falling far, far less than what the ideal required. The church of his time said to him that if he did what was in him, if you remember we talked last time about the theology of William of Ockham, if he did what was in him, God would give him grace, and then things would be all right. But the problem was, how much do you have to do before God will give you grace? And this was Luther's problem. He entered into the monastic experience, and he tried with all his heart. He prayed. He fasted. He went to church seven times a day, according to the monastic regimen. He confessed his sins regularly, very regularly. His confessor, who was the head of the monastery, a man by the name of Johann Staupitz, used to be driven nuts by Luther. Of course, you had to make a good confession. And Luther was so earnest in his confessions that he kept, in Staupitz's eyes, confessing all these sins that appeared to be trifles. Finally, Staupitz even said to him at one point, my goodness, go out and commit a real sin, will you? Blaspheme. Steal something. Do something really wrong. Give yourself something really something to confess. And of course, Luther, in the midst of crisis, well, you know how you hear good advice when you're in the midst of crisis. <laughs> he didn't take it to heart. He wasn't able to take it to heart. He felt that he was falling short of this ideal that God required of him. And more, moreover, if he should die, he felt that he was condemned. 
we actually have a firsthand account written later of what Luther was going through during his time in the monastery. Luther used a special German word to describe his experience during this time. It's called anfaktum. It's a word that really isn't, doesn't have a precise translation into English. It best describes a spiritual duel or battle or struggle. And this is what Luther described his inner state during this time. It's all the doubt and pain and despair that one can muster and shove it into one experience. Luther felt very threatened and and he trembled in the face of God because this relationship between himself and God was not right. On factum, these assaults of God or the assaults of the devil, and for a while Luther couldn't even tell which was which anyway, tormented him. Such was his state, in fact, that he even began to hate God. God would seem so unjust. He had this ideal and Luther was falling short. And of course, hating God was even a worse sin. That's blasphemy. <laughs> and that would send him even further into despair. So he's on this vicious downward cycle of despair and hopelessness. It needs to be remembered all through this. You know, I'm going to step down. <laughs> My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And where else would you have been? 
quantify it. What do we want to Stands as one and six, one and six.
Thanks, Mark, for a great two days. We look forward to the President tomorrow and Friday. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us ourselves to eternal life. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Teach us your ways, O Lord, and we will walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts that we may fear your name. Show us your ways, O Lord, teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are our God, our Savior, and our hope is in you all day long. Amen. We now turn to hymn 239. God's word is our great heritage. Please stand.
I'm uh, very pleased to uh, participate again in again in uh, what has become a tradition here. I asked Pastor Wool today when this all started, that is the idea of taking a full week around Reformation Sunday to, uh, to review, to look at uh, different aspects, historical and theological, that relate to Luther and the Reformation. He said he came here 14 years ago, and it was shortly after that, that uh, I think he had the idea initially and just it related to being tired of trying to re, you know, schedule chapel all the time. And so he said, would you do this? For several years, Paul Homer and I, uh, am I doing that? It's your heart. It's my heart. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I do that every month. <laughs> if, if that continues, I'll just turn it off. Um, Paul uh, then retired, and I, I would go five days in a row, which I, delight, I was really delighted to do that. And it was very pleasant uh, this year to share this time with uh, Dr. Tranvik, and I learned a lot from his, his presentations. I want to make a personal note first. Uh, you may note <laughs> during this event, I will be making noise. <laughs> I'll just turn it off. I can speak up. Can you... happens and uh, the reason uh, the reason I do that when I when my eyes run I can't see my notes and uh, now today I'm not going to use any notes but I also can't see the clock <laughs> and when I uh, when I can't see notes or a clock I tend as an old theological professor to talk in one hour increments and if I did that I would be in deep difficulty with uh, people on the faculty and the rest of you uh, today and tomorrow, I want to talk about uh, not Luther as an individual. Luther as an individual writer wrote tremendous amounts. I want to talk about Luther and others uh, in their writings as they become uh, the voice of the community. And uh, people's writings, whether it's a committee or individuals, become voices of the Christian community when their writings are incorporated into what we call confessional statements. These are statements of faith, they are statements of self-understanding, and uh, they, in turn, having been adopted officially, become the voice of the community. Uh, by doing that, I want to shift away from the understanding of Reformation as a singular historical or personal event in history, and rather think about Reformation as a continuing process that is meant to con be continuous in each of us as we return to the biblical themes of repentance and faith uh, that are quite clearly presented by, among others, uh, uh, our Lord. Now, we have confessional documents in the Lutheran Church. Other churches do, too. The Anglicans have the 39 Articles. The Roman Catholics have the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. The Presbyterians and other followers of Calvinists have the Westminster Confession. We have a book of the Book of Concord, and I haven't got love to talk about this, how we got here, but uh, some of these pieces are in here are written by Luther, uh, some by Philip Melanchthon, his younger colleague, and then there's a long piece at the end that's a committee document. Uh, I have always argued that this book has a center, not, you know, not in the middle here, where you open it up as you do the Bible, you come to Psalms, uh, and not chronologically, but it has a focus. Another way of saying that is that I believe that when Lutherans have been healthy theologically, they've always been concerned about one question, one major question. And everything else relates, relates to that question. I have to apologize. Some faculty, in 14 or 12 years, uh, you've heard this before. But if you're like me, uh, it's been there, done that, can't remember. That's an age factor. <laughs> that this has a center, and the closer you get to the center, and the, the central question, and the answer that they believe comes from the scripture, the firmer Lutherans have been. 
the less likely they are to adjust and to adapt and so on and so forth. The further you get away from the center, as long as you're still related and connected to it, the more freedom you have uh, in the Lutheran tradition. We, uh, there are no prescriptions in here about worship, for example. Whether you're high church or low church doesn't make any difference. There are no particular prescriptions about polity, how the church is organized. So Lutherans have had superintendents, they've had bishops, they've had district presidents, and so on and so forth. They're all possible as long as you're clear at the center and the central question. The central question for Lutherans has always been, how does one come into relationship with God? And uh, today, in a little while, I want to tell you uh, part of their answer, which is negative, and then you have to come back for the positive answer on Friday. I hope you can do that. How does one come into relationship with God? Why are they so concerned about that? Uh, they're concerned because they believe that we were created for fellowship with God. We were made for it. And when we find ourselves in any other condition or position, it's tragic. Uh, they would like to cite, for example, and we could cite the, the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was not born to be off in a far country uh, feeding off the husks that the pigs did not eat and daydreaming about how the servants in his father's house at home were fed and happy and so forth. He was not made for that. He was made to be living uh, as a loyal, uh, loving son in his father's house. Okay? To use some other illustrations, uh, we have a cabin on the South Shore of Lake Superior that we built a long time ago. From our, from our place, we can see the westernmost of the uh, Apostle Islands. You know, it's Bayfields off 17 miles. One of the places is called Eagle Island. Appropriately, there are a lot of eagles up there. You can see them flying around. They sometimes perch in trees right in front of the cabin. You don't have to go that far. You can go over to the St. Croix, or you can go down uh, by Wabashaw in the Mississippi and see these great birds. An eagle, I would argue, just by the way it looks, seems to have been made for something. It's got great, powerful wings. It's got powerful talons. It's got a hook beak, fantastic eyes. An eagle is made to be soaring 500 feet above the Mississippi looking for carrion for prey, or above Lake Superior or, five, or in the Rockies. It's made for that. It is not made to be sitting in a zoo, say at Como Park. Okay? And if you can pass one of these great birds sitting in a cage uh, and don't feel <coughs> something is amiss, incongruous, incorrect, then you're not very sensitive. Eagles are made for things. And, and the argument of the reformers that, is that we are made to live in relationship uh, with God. Well, another question is, uh, why get all excited? Aren't we in relationship? And the reformers would say, no, we're not. We were made for it, but something has intervened. And the intervention was sin. Now you'll see, as this talk goes on, and in your own reading, how seriously they take sin. Now, if, uh, if all we had to say was the negative side of their position, their, uh, then Garrison Keillor would be right in his often stated descriptions of Lutherans, Norwegian Lutherans being weighed down with guilt. It's not, not true, because you've got to have both sides of the story. Uh, sin has intervened. And so uh, the question is how, given the fact of sin, can, re can relationship be reestablished? In the whole history of the Christian church, there have been only three major answers to this, this question. The first one is associated with a British monk and theologian whose name was Pelagius. He died in about 420. Uh, we don't know a lot about him. In fact, most of what we know comes from the pens of his opponents. But we have picked up some things. He was uh, from Britain. He was a monk. In fact, he had been an oblate monk. That means that as while well, he was still a boy, a young person, he was given to the monastery, just like the story of Samuel in the Old Testament. He'd grown up in this context. Uh, from what he writes, we would conclude that his own spiritual odyssey, his own development was rather peaceful and uneventful. He, he does not seem to be aware of the problems of gross sin. You know? 
Uh, in fact, in a well-run monastery, it's difficult to be guilty of gross sin today. Uh, it's a very ordered, disciplined, observed uh, life. At any rate, he was, perhaps because of this background stuff, rather optimistic about human nature. And his answer to how relationship is established, he said, God comes with his grace. By grace, uh, Pelagius meant the law as an example that we should follow, that we, a game plan really, that we observe. And he, by grace, he meant Jesus Christ as an example. Okay, so grace has been given, the law and the example of Christ, and we play by the rules and follow the example of Jesus by virtue of our innate capacities. And by doing that, we are brought into relationship. Uh, now, you'll certainly have to say in this scheme that God is the prime actor. He is the doer. I mean, he gives grace. But there is a great emphasis upon the innate capacities of the sinner to play by the rules and follow the example. So the real, I mean, you get down to it. You push, thank you very much, God, but the real credit, if there is credit, belongs to, to me. Well, it was inevitable that there would be opposition to this, and the great opponent of Pelagius presented the second option on how relationship is established. That person is uh, Augustine. He's such a towering theologian that everybody in the Reformation era cited Augustine. The Roman Catholics quoted Augustine, Luther, Calvin especially. Uh, he was, his experience, his development was very different from that of Pelagius. Pelagius' spiritual growth had been very uneventful, peaceful, and he was basically optimistic about humanity and its capacities. Things were very different for Augustine. For one thing, he was the product of a mixed marriage. His mother, Monica, was a very devout Christian, but his father, Patricius, was a very passionate pagan. So in the home, you have this tension. And Augustine was a very precocious young man, and he went through all the stages of education, became a very Famous, he was the chief rhetorician for the city of Milan. That meant whenever they needed to have some representation to the emperor, Augustine would be the guy that would go and do it. And by this time, he had been influenced enough by his mother, he wanted to become a Christian, passionately, but he was unable to. Uh, we remember, uh, and, and it was a time of great struggle. He tried all kinds of things. He was a stoic for a while. He was never a skeptic, but he, he Neoplatonism, all the, the themes possible of the day, he tried, but he was always dissatisfied, deeply aware of being unable to turn himself uh, to God because of sin. Now, I don't want to overdo this and say he was always struggling to... Uh, to become Christian, we remember him partly for a very famous prayer, a statement that he made, O Lord, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. There's another prayer he had at this time when he was in the struggle period, which I really think is interesting. It shows the humanity of the person. Some of you remember this. I see Bev Stratton smiling already. Uh, he had a concubine at this time, you know, a lady to whom he was not married, but he was living with, and one of his prayers was, O Lord, grant me chastity, but not yet. I, <laughs> I think, I mean, it's very human people. Now, it was only, it was only through the ministry of a great pastor named Ambrose in Milan. Uh, we have some of Ambrose's stuff in our hymn book, text. And through the reading of the scripture, the study, unending study of scripture, and primarily through what Augustine experienced as the sovereign power of God, that he became a Christian. Now, with that background and that experience, when he started reading what Pelagius was saying, uh, he really got more than irritated, and he started responding with passion. And, I mean, it was a bitter, bitter argument. And Augustine, in contrast to Pelagius, said everything depends upon God's sovereign decision and his bringing me to him, okay? So you got two extremes. Inevitably, a third part, third position develops. I have to watch the time. I got five minutes left. Uh, in 529, little history, there was a synod at Orange. And they adopted a position that if you like it, you'll call it semi-Augustinian. If you don't like it, you call it semi-Pelagian. 
They argued that God came with his prevenient grace. That means grace coming ahead of time. And he addressed me. And then, by virtue of my innate capacities, if I respond properly, I acquire what is called a merit of fittingness. I've done that which it is fitting for me to do. So you've got God doing his thing. I respond properly. I acquire the key word is merit. When, someone, when you acquire merit, someone is up obliged, obligated to respond in turn, okay? God has to respond. I mean, he set it all up, but he does respond to merit here, and he gives an increase of grace, which is seen probably mainly as an enabling power in this scheme, and that comes especially through the sacraments, through the church, and by using these things properly, I respond again, and I acquire what's called a merit of worthiness or condignity. So I've done that which is fitting, I've got more grace, I respond again, and I have this merit of worthiness, which is relationship. I am in relationship. The key to this is this cooperation as we move along, and the notion of merit. Now, the reason I mention this is not because it's simply a mediating position, but if you are or have friends who are conservative Roman Catholics, uh, this is still their theological scheme. It is this, I respond by virtue of my innate capacities, I still got them. Reason, conscience, free will, and things are blunted by the fall, but they're still working, see? And I respond properly, you'll get the picture. Three main schemes. Now, I could ask, and I would ask, but I don't expect an answer because we haven't got time. Where do you think Luther came out in this scheme, given what Mark talked about yesterday? This, his experience was very much like Augustine's. It was a, a matter of trial and, <coughs> and uh, great difficulty and awareness of sin, the seriousness of sin. So it's true to summarize, Luther, Luther was an August, not only an Augustinian monk, but he was Augustinian theologically in this context. Now, that's all introduction. Now we move away from Luther as an individual and this historical sketch in about three minutes, I'll tell you what Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession says. It's a nice summary, their answer. And I want to emphasize how important they felt this question was. I didn't cite Luther. Luther in the Schmalkaldic Articles, which is also a confessional document, said, of this article, nothing can be given up. In heaven and earth, if heaven and earth and all things temporal should pass away. And later he says, uh, on this one article rests all that we teach against the world, the devil, and the pope. Now, we certainly would remove the Holy Father from that group of three, but the seriousness of the question. Now, in Article 4, and this is all primer for the good news Friday. Article 4 says simply, it is impossible to be justified that is accepted, brought into relationship, adopted. All of these are reconciled. All of these are synonyms. It is impossible to be justified in the presence of God by our own merits, works, or strengths. As some of you who are old-fashioned Lutherans may be brought up, have been brought up with the small catechism, that's stated another way with probably greater clarity in the explanation to the third article of the Creed. Uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Luther says, I, what is meant by this? He says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord nor come to him. <coughs> But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in true faith. In like manner, as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it in union with Christ its Lord. The key word for us, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason, merit, or strength, believe or come to, to, uh, to Christ. Now, why do they talk this way? mainly because they take sin very seriously. They were arguing against their Roman Catholic contemporaries who were, you know, a synod of orange, semi-Pelagian types that merit cooperation. They were also arguing against another Protestant group, the Anabaptists, who believed that the key to the Christian life was following discipleship, following after, but they were very optimistic about how one became a disciple. The Lutherans and the Calvinists later were very pessimistic about human possibilities apart from God's action. They were not pessimistic about human capabilities as they relate to other people. 
It is possible, fully possible, to have just on the, my innate abilities to, to work what they call civil righteousness, but they're not talking about that. They're talking about not how I relate to David Wold, but how I relate to God. And so they have this, and it's, it's important to note also, they say, it is not possible to be justified in the presence of God. Because they make a distinction between, as I just did, between Anderson as he stands in the presence of God and Anderson as he stands in relationship to you. Okay? Now, I affirm theologically the notion of standing in the presence of God. That's so important. But personally, I prefer always to be standing in your presence. So you might say to me, for example, uh, Anderson, for an ordained person, president of a Lutheran college, you drink too much. I might say, well, you're right. Perhaps you're right. I do like to have two glasses of wine before dinner. You know? I can't do that now when I'm taking the pills because they don't agree. That, but that's not every week, fortunately. Uh, but I, I do like it. Maybe that's too much, but, and I'm sorry about that, and I'll have to try to change. But let me tell you about my neighbor, Mr. Jansen, on Grantham Street, farther up in the St. Anthony Park. He, he is an alcoholic. His wife divorced him last summer, took the kids, uh, cleaned out the house, and so forth. And, uh, and he's, just, he's just finished. Now, you see what I've done in that context. You can, you can give me any illustration of the bad things that I do or the bad things that I am, and I can always find someone, even on this campus, who's worse off than I am. You know? And I feel good. They don't allow that. That's not what they're talking about. Justified in the presence of God. So they're talking uh, in the context of Roman Catholic and a Baptist, and, uh, and uh, this is their negative affirmation. And I'm three minutes over. Now, please, <laughs> please come back on Friday, because if you don't, you might go around for the rest of the week feeling guilty. You know, <laughs> I mean, there is no, there is no way to, I mean, I've just said there is no way to be justified in the presence of God by our own merits and strength. Ooh. Well, preview, they go on to say, it is God who justifies. <coughs> He does it freely, <coughs> pardon me, he does it freely because of Christ through faith. And uh, if you get that, uh, you don't have to be a good Lutheran, but you'll be a good evangelical Christian. And uh, I hope you'll come back. Are you going to say something? Okay. <laughs> the president told me to thank him for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Actually, it, it was great. And it will be... I'm sure it will be really even greater on Friday. But tomorrow we have a uh, pianist. Lois Larson has uncovered a pianist that has Augsburg connections, who apparently is fantastic, and uh, is, coming, is performing around town here for a short time, but he consented to come. I don't know much about him, but she says he's great, and if you miss it, you're missing something pretty special. So come tomorrow at 1120. Uh, tonight is uh, communion. That's 9.30. We sure invite you all for that. We call it campus-wide communion for that very reason. And then, of course, uh, Friday, uh, don't miss the president. Uh, receive the benediction. The Lord Almighty order our days and deeds in peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks.
Happy Reformation Day. Uh, I'm sure most of you have known that that uh, was going to happen, and it's today. And we're taking an interruption from the Inter Reformation series to hear uh, a wonderful pianist who will be introduced in a few seconds. But we're going to begin our worship this morning with the Reformation Day prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies and bestow on the church your saving peace through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. As mentioned uh, earlier, we were going to have a special guest, and uh, it's fitting that I guess on Reformation Day, honoring Luther, we would have music, because Luther certainly was a man of music and wrote many texts to hymns. And Lois Larson has arranged our chapel today, and she will introduce our guest. Ooh. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce my friend Don Irwin. I've known Don for a total of maybe three weeks, and uh, it took me all of 20 seconds after I introduced myself to ask him if he would play for us in chapel. He has a tremendous gift, and I hope that you enjoy it as much as I do. Don. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here on a, a nice winter day, although it's not winter. But uh, I lived here in Minneapolis for a, a long time and uh, had kind of a tie with the uh, school here. Uh, one of my uh, piano teachers, I've had a lot of teachers through the years, but uh, one of my teachers is a lady named Celeste O'Brien. And uh, I, uh, last year, was able to play uh, with the uh, Minnesota Orchestra. And uh, it was kind of a dream of mine to uh, always play Rachmaninoff's second concerto. And so uh, I worked for months and months and months with Celeste in that room down the hall so I, that I could play that. But uh, most of the concerts that I do are, uh, I grew up playing classical music, but are not really classical music. And uh, it's kind of funny you guys start with a song from Zimbabwe because I've uh, spent a lot of my life in South Africa and, and Zimbabwe uh, playing concerts all over uh, Africa. And uh, a lot of the music that I do uh, comes from experiences around the world. Uh, I've played in over 40 countries, and uh, we've done tours all over Europe and Russia and the Middle East, and uh, even played in India and uh, South America. And the beginning of uh, this next year, I'll be in China and Hong Kong and Taiwan, a lot of different areas over there. Uh, I was actually up here, I uh, flew up here yesterday to do an uh, event at uh, the Hilton last night for a, a, a thing called Church Metro, and uh, it was a, a little different because it, uh, it was about 300 business people and all of the uh, kind of the, the big names in business in uh, Minnesota were there, and uh, I'd, I would like look at name tags and see like Piper Jaffray or, you know, whoever, and I go, oh, I know your building, and uh, you know, they kind of all have these skyscrapers after their names, but um, I uh, decided last night, I, I normally travel with a bunch of musicians, and uh, they're all, uh, I live in Texas, and all my musicians are from Austin, Texas, and uh, we play a lot of different kind of music. Uh, the, the music that we're doing right now is really considered world music, and so it has a lot of percussion instruments, and uh, a lot of different instruments that you wouldn't maybe find in, a, in an orchestra, but uh, I think I'm, we have kind of a short time here, and I'm just going to uh, go through uh, a little bit of my life, how I started uh, musically, and uh, what, it, what I did to uh, get to where I'm at. And uh, I started taking piano lessons. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and started taking piano lessons when I was six years old, and I kind of went through this... Uh, uh, thing where uh, here I am starting taking piano lessons like every other kid starts and I would come home from my lessons and I would have my mother play the piece for me because she 
uh, had taken piano uh, in college and uh, she could read music really well and I uh, was a fine pianist and so I'd, I'd get my mother to play for me and so she would play, I remember these little songs that sounded like this, I'll give you an example. Well, she would like play a tune like that for me and then she would go off like in the kitchen and uh, do what she was doing and I would sit down and play it back except stare out the window, you know. But I never looked at the music and uh, I took for over a year uh, and I remember this one piano uh, lesson where the, uh, t my piano teacher she had this like long ruler and like pointed to the page and started asking me what the notes were. Well, I didn't have a clue what the notes were because I was playing by ear the whole time. And um, somehow she wasn't real impressed with me uh, and my ear ability. And uh, she preferred that I learn how to read the notes. So she asked my mom, you know, stop playing uh, these, uh, you know, pieces for me so he can like do every good boy does fine and everything that kids have to do. And uh, so I learned, and I learned how to read music and took classical piano lessons, and uh, by the time, well, we were living in Austin uh, pretty much my whole life, and uh, we went to a Baptist church there in Austin, and my mother was the uh, church pianist for a Baptist church. Well, I would do these classical piano lessons, and by the time I was in sixth grade, I was playing like rock modern off and C-sharp minor and a lot of the different pieces, a lot of the the easier Beethoven sonatas, and um, I was doing really well at that. Well, uh, when I was 10 years old, my mother uh, volunteered me to be our church pianist. And uh, just to give you an example, you know, our church was uh, different. We, we didn't, well, we had an organ and a piano, but uh, to give you an example of what Southern Baptist church music sounds like, I'll, I'll play something like my mother would have played it. And it wouldn't matter what song I picked out of the hymnal, she made them all sound just like that. And uh, just kind of a style, I think it kind of came from Scott Joplin or something, but uh, she would play that way and all of a sudden she wanted me to play that way and of course I did not know how to play that. And so she would take out the hymnal and four part harmony and write in all these little octave things and all this stuff that needed to be in there for the Baptist church. And uh, of course I'm like 10 years old and I'm not, uh, so fast and technically uh, fast yet. So uh, when I played for church, uh, it would sound a little bit more like this. So that I'd like play a line and they'd sing a line and it would like take twice as long. Well, um, here I am like, I always had this ear ability and I, I had uh, the ability to sit down and I would turn the radio on and play by ear with whatever song was on the radio and learned a lot of different styles. Well, um, in Austin, Texas, all of a sudden country music was getting like really big and so Willie Nelson had moved to town and Waylon Jennings and all these like older country guys. And uh, I went to concerts with my brother and saw all these people doing concerts and uh, really saw, the, well, I remember this one concert where uh, there was a pianist named Floyd Kramer there. I'd never heard of him. And uh, he was like the epitome of country and Western piano playing. He had uh, one of his songs, uh, his big hit uh, back then was a song called Last Date. Well, I heard him play and I, I would like sneak over behind stage so I could watch the piano players play and I'd like go home and copy what they did. And so they would play stuff and Floyd Kramer's Last Date, uh, most of you are probably a little young to know this song, but 
Uh, they still do it on those late night TV advertisements like you can order Floyd Kramer music. Um, sounds something like this. Well, all of a sudden I started making everything Floyd Kramer style and I would like take Moonlight Sonata and all of a sudden turn it into uh, Floyd Kramer. Uh, but you know, here I, I, by the time I was 14 years old I was playing for Willie Nelson in his studios and doing a lot of recording work and uh, I remember like go, going to piano lessons and I never told my classical teacher that I could, I was just like doing classical music because to her that was the only kind of music there was and um, I would do church music and you know, with all these octaves and then I was playing country music in bands and stuff and um, I decided one Sunday morning to kind of like uh, uh, change our Baptist church music a little bit and uh, so I for the offertory I played something that sounded like this and here I was this kid and I didn't know any better so it sounded something like this Well, that was the last Sunday I ever got to play at church, and uh, no, they they actually kind of liked it. But uh, you know, I started playing it for a lot of different people, and uh, the concerts that I'm doing now, I, I wish I could play some of that music for you, but it really takes all the instruments to play it. And uh, I'm on a tour. We're kind of a, a little break for a couple of days here. I'm on a tour around the United States, uh, and. Uh, a couple of nights ago I just played in Austin, Texas, and then I was in Oklahoma City, and then I flew up here last night uh, for the event. Uh, this coming week I'm at the uh, State Theater, uh, and we're doing uh, a large concert. All the musicians are flying up for that, and uh, for the first time, uh, I know a lot of you are probably musicians, and uh, we're adding, uh, back when uh, music started getting into computers and uh, the MIDI stuff, uh, I'd, I started, was one of the first guys here in Minneapolis to really get into that and to have Kurzweil uh, keyboards and different things and uh, I always wanted to uh, be able to play some of the electronic stuff but not lose the uh, musicality of it and what I learned in classical music and uh, we've kind of uh, achieved that in our concerts but also uh, we've added video to that where we have a 50 foot video wall behind the musicians and some of it is like uh, pre-taped so it might be a scene like in Africa that we picked up and then they can actually put the musicians into the scene live and so uh, it's pretty incredible to see it's like uh, we're, all the guys that are with the video company are from Seattle Washington and um, we're kind of just now putting that together and so Minneapolis next week uh, November the 9th is the first show uh, that we're using this and uh, it's pretty interesting because the keyboards if you have a scene up there where it's uh, the desert and there's a lot of reds in it uh, if you actually want it to be more red through a musical instrument digital interface and through the Macintosh computers um, I can press down on my keyboard and if I press uh, with more uh, strength and press into the keyboards the screen the 50 foot screen will actually become more red and if I back off of it, it, it totally changes and it uh, kind of, uh, you never get the same effect twice. It's pretty interesting. Well, uh, I'm going to play one last song 
And uh, I was going to do some classical music, but I don't think I have time. So I, I'm, I'm going to do something that I'm going to... Uh, uh, I did a CD a, a few months ago uh, that I put down a lot of hymns in it. And uh, I basically would take a lot of the uh, classical ideas and put them into the hymns. And uh, I think I'm going to play uh, one that's called Christ the Lord is Risen Today and uh, use some of the classical ideas in that. So. I think I don't I have not been watching the time. What time do you guys need to be out of here? Okay. There's a quick version and we'll get you out. Thank you. I would, uh, I would love to see some of you guys at the concert, and uh, if some of you have some interest in seeing how all the multimedia and the video 
uh, stuff works, you may uh, just want to talk to us afterwards if you have time. So thank you for having us. And tickets through Ticketmaster probably, huh? Uh, yeah, you can actually get them cheaper if you go to the box office. Though, so. Okay. <clears throat> That's Saturday, the 9th of November. Thanks a million, Don, for being here. Tomorrow, the president wraps up the uh, Reformation series with uh, uh, his time. He's not here. Uh, he was here. Receive the benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.